Jensen, welcome to the Colorado Food Magazine. Thank you for having me. And glad to have you here. We have lots and lots and lots to talk about. I'm ready. We're going to label this one David versus Goliath. Not you and I, David versus Goliath, but us. Well, we had a long conversation. We're both David. Exactly. And we're going to take on the Goliath because we talk about what's needed. Leadership, mm. education, <laughs> just a human face. Uh, all hospitality. These, <laughs> yeah, just being basically kind. Uh, I'm excited about that. So I want to learn a lot about you. I've, I've been doing some research. We've talked right. a lot, a lot of the things you've done. Congratulations on your successes, uh, what you've done. And it's pretty amazing. So congratulations, number one. You were selected as uh, one of the top 20 influential hospitality. Kind of flesh that out for me. Yeah, nation's restaurant news, I think yes. it was. Yep, exactly. You know, I think that's just because I'm out here talking a lot, a lot, a lot. And really, I'm just trying to to get the word out about what it means to be in the hospitality industry. And I think entities like that are starting to take notice because I think what it meant to be a chef was very monolithic. It was very linear. It was very singular. Like, can you create the best food? And now we're recognizing that the internal guests, the expectation of hospitality for ourselves and for each other as teams, I, mean, I know we'll talk about teams and leadership a lot, is maybe more important than what you put on the plate. So I think that's where it's starting to get a little bit of attention. I love those, I love those accolades because they create just enough awareness for what we're working on. But you know, that's, that's not the goal. Right, exactly. Right, we're trying. We're trying to build for a better future. We're trying to empower and educate those future leaders. Exactly. It's you know we we talked about this. We had an extensive conversation last week, which was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't get to talk to many people where it's just like, yep, I get it. Absolutely, we're working on that. How can I help you with this? I've talked to these ten people. You need to talk to these twenty people. Like that was really refreshing to hear because we are pushing mud uphill a lot of times. Oh, yeah, like. I, exactly. We're almost like Sisyphus, pushing that rock up there, fly back. But Let's but go. I think I think we're going to bend that strategic arc. I mean, I've Agreed. looked at what you've done. You've done a magnificent job for a few years, uh, quite a few years. So, I mean, I'm happy to have an ally like you that yes. understands. Because oftentimes when I go out there and talk to these re either restaurant groups or people, I get the nice, like, oh, that's so nice. Well, aren't you <laughs> precious? Bless your heart. <laughs> exactly. And like, oh, what can I do to help? And there's yeah. a lot of talk and very little action. Yes. Stuck. Exactly. They're stuck. And even just this, this conversation where we're trying to evolve our own perceptions, our preconceived notions, the historical, quote unquote, successes that we've had, they've all led us to this moment. And we've been called out that restaurants are not a great place to work. And we have to decide what we're going to do about that as leaders. And so even just that we're having this conversation here, that we're on camera, that Mario is on the ones and twos, making sure that we look good, that we sound good, is important because all of the decision making, all of the things that have driven the narrative have happened behind closed doors with Goliath or whoever sets the quote unquote industry standards that do not serve us. And now it has to be the little guys and the people that exactly. are actually going to build this. And your network, the Hispanic Restaurant Association, like that is the lifeblood of this industry. Exactly. That's what I pointed out. I got to give a shout out to Mario. He's the one that introduced us first. So thank you for that. And like, oh, I, once I started doing a little digging, I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, Mario. And then we talked. We had a great conversation last week. But you're absolutely right. The reason we formed the Hispanic Restaurant Association was because the 60, 70, 80, depending on what statistical model you look at. Big numbers. Uh, we make up the restaurant industry, food and service, beverage industry, all the way from the JBSs to the to the farms, the laborers, right. to the restaurant industry. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure I'm, I, I would, if I'm wrong, somebody, I please, I accept your input to say you're wrong. And I'll change my mind if that's the case. I will not be one of those people. Is <laughs> absolutely, our entire food infrastructure is built on the backs, blood, sweat, and tears. All of it is true of the Hispanic community. And our goal is to is to provide a path of progression, provide a leadership model, and develop the culture for long term. Well, we're not saying like that's put right. everybody in, in, in people in leadership positions when they're not trained. We're saying let's develop them from the start. That's why we came out with the five pillar leadership model. You know, I, I showed you right before this and we talked about it last yeah, like week. It. The, the, the cultural ethos part of that is not saying your culture versus my culture from a ethnicity or a race perspective. It's about what are we bringing to the table? What, what do I have? Who, who am I? 
and what can I contribute to this? And one of the things we, we the next part is leadership at all levels. Not only are we asking the restaurants to lead, but we're also asking the employee to lead themselves. And like, are you showing up to work on time? Are you showing up, you know, mm-hmm. ready to roll so that you get they get the value out of you? And then we ask the education part at all levels. How are you educating this boy to be better in leadership? Yeah. What are you doing to help them get to the next level? Instead of just coming in as a dishwasher, how are you teaching yeah. them to go, get, get all the way up? Or that's what we're asking the restaurant industry. Well, what I like most about what we talked about within the model of leadership is it has to be bottom to top, really. And so much is this trickle down of top to bottom. When you look at the hierarchy pyramid, we have to flip that thing completely on its axis. And so many times when you see leadership models, it's all about the leader knowing all the isms to be able to impart, to inspire people. And, and I've fallen into the trap, and I still do sometimes. You know, I, I, love, I love my isms. I think it's important <laughs> to understand the impact that it has. It's also important to be able to let people at every level know that this is the model we're on. So right. everybody has the same playbook. And a lot of times that doesn't happen where we are forcing a new model of leadership on people who have no idea in what way, for what reason they're getting led. Like what is the goal? What is the path? What's our mission? What's our vision? What's our why? We don't spend enough time on that because we've self-commoditized our food product. We're only as good as our next plate up. Smile. It's part of your uniform. (laughs) We perpetuate these short, short term thinking tropes that don't allow us to really grow. And so I'm really, look, I spent my entire career as a chef being like, what I put on the plate is the expression of who I am. It is the opus of the value that I bring into the ecosystem of food and beverage. And what I'm really realizing now, it's not what's on the plate. It's who gets to the plate. It's how it gets to the plate. That's what truly matters. And if you tell that story, then food is no longer commoditized. And that is, but that's a big paradigm shift. Oh, it's, it's huge. And, and, and we're slowly bending that. You're absolutely right, because we want to do something called Who's Feeding Us, a documentary. Mm. Mario's in that. And it talks about the farmer. It talks about the chef. It talks about the busboy. It talks about the dishwasher. Who's feeding us? Yeah. It's the Hispanic community. 100%. <laughs> and our goal is to provide that platform so they can eventually lead it. And there are a lot of great leaders. like There's like Pablo Aya, Zuri, Manny, yes. all these, you know, Carlos Gaetan, uh, he's a as far as my understanding, the only Mexican chef ever to receive a Michelin star. Uh, and then there's uh, Fernando Stobel. He's recently come on board. He was the only Mexican chef that was, uh, he's half Mexican, half uh, English, but he was uh, catered to the queen. That's kind of a big deal. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the talent is there. We, yeah. we both know that. Yeah. But so I want to learn a little bit more about you, though, before we keep going. We could talk for hours. Uh, I, know. I know we could. How long we got? Yeah, exactly is tell me how you started. I saw in your biography that you, uh, you know, long line of chefs in your family. We go back. And w- well, what was long the, way. and then what was the epiphany that like, oh, I've been looking at it wrong. What changed or what caused that? Well, taking it all the way back, I'm the fifth consecutive generation in our family to be a part of the hospitality industry. We opened our first restaurant in 1900 in oh, Little really? Falls, Minnesota. Oh, wow. Called La Fond House, French family. Uh, I've only seen pictures of it. Looks like one of those corner saloons where Wyatt Earp would have shot somebody out front. Like uh-huh. that, that style, that vibe. And that was great, great grandparents. Then great grandparents and grandparents had restaurants and bars in San Francisco. And my dad's three younger brothers all own restaurants. My brother also in the industry. He's cooked with me for a long time. And he's in California now. Well, you can give the restaurants a shout out. Our I mean, dad can't <laughs> boil an egg. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, but all his family, very talented in the industry. And that's yeah, well, that's where I started. Wallaby's Bar and Grill in Ames, Iowa, where Iowa State University is, is where I started when I was 17 years old. I moved from California to Ames, Iowa. Big culture shock. I thought I was just going for a summer job, get away from, you know, being a troubled teen and youth and, and, and all of that in San Diego. Moved to Ames, Iowa, hang out with my uncle for a while, cool Uncle Rico, and... Once I got into the kitchen, it was, I mean, the first time there was a pile of dishes as tall as me, and I'm 6'2". I was like, this is wild. What's going on here? And the energy, the vibe, the 
the bravado, all of it. I, I just, I really, at that moment at 17, I really needed that. Right? I needed right. to kind of find my people. And there was strength in that. Like, I still really appreciate finding that sense of belonging. I think sometimes we lose track of that. Right. And in that moment for myself, I wanted to be a part of something that I could build and develop and grow as an individual. I also saw the opportunity in the American food and dining scene in the year 2000. There was a lot of potential. It wasn't like Europe. It wasn't this highly established thing. And there was a moment, I went to culinary school, and there was a moment when I recognized that I wanted to be a chef. Because at that point, I was a, I was a dirtbag line cook, right, in my uncle's <laughs> restaurant. And I wanted to be a chef. I started going to culinary school because I didn't know what else you do. Yeah. And I recognized at culinary school, there were three books that came into my orbit. Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain. I was like, wow, there's other people that are also pirates and outcasts and misfits. What does that mean for our potential to be valued in some way, shape, or form? There was Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. I didn't realize that service and hospitality meant so much that I could be a part of something that was changing people's lives is what it felt like. And then the French Laundry Cookbook, Thomas oh, Keller's book. Thomas those, Keller. Those three books, I was like, I didn't, I didn't know food could look like that. Like, what, what is going on there? So that was like a big catalyst for me early on and then went through the trajectory. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a type A, steep trajectory, ambitious. I was like, I want to go and learn, be the best, finished culinary school, went and worked for James Beard award-winning chef types, Debbie Gold in Kansas City. Very, very influential, still very influential for me as well. What made you seek out that excellence? You know, I, <laughs> this is interesting, probably a, a lack of self-worth to some degree. And I always wanted to prove something. I was not as smart as the smart kids and not as cool as the cool kids. Of course, what I told myself was that I was smarter than the cool kids and cooler than the smart kids just to be able to survive <laughs> oh, I like right, that. coming I up. That. And so I didn't quite fit in anywhere. And once I found that, I said, okay, I'm going to take this platform and I'm going to prove that I'm worthwhile. Part of the problem is when we're talking about leadership is I didn't know what that meant. So what I did, what most of us do is we look at the examples out there. And in the year 2000 and on, we were in that food network effect where it's like, oh, what a chef is, is somebody who screams and yells at people and the throws plates at their control and authoritarian dictator. 100%. And I fell into those traps sometimes of if I was oppressed to the degree that I saw on television or in these Michelin starred restaurants, then I must be doing something right. I wore that as a badge of honor. And a lot of us did that I could overcome and survive that kind of abuse. And unfortunately, as a leader as well, when I got into leadership roles, which was way too young, I became an executive chef at 24, a restaurant owner at 29, burnout by 33. Steep trajectory. I think a lot of people feel that. How old are you now? 40. Okay. Turned 40 oh, this past 40, year. Yeah. Yeah. Officially a legend in your own mind. Now I am an <laughs> elder of this industry, and I'm excited to, to still have a little bit of ego and bravado. I'm able to do it from the sidelines now, though, okay. to be able to have an impact of what happens on the field, because I know... I can't be on the field anymore. It, it gave me a lot, and it took nearly everything from yeah, me. Yeah, well. I always make fun of people when I say fun. Of, I'm obviously over forty. There's any man over forty that's a dad or been in the industry that they're legends in their own mind. Because now we can say, "Well, back in my day, mm -hmm. <laughs> back in the day, and when so, I when I was coming up in the exactly. industry." Uh, at, I, what's interesting too, not only my age, but also maybe where I fit within the construct of generations is I'm one of those elder millennials or exennials, right? Born in 1982, where I'm right on the fringe. We had a rotary phone. I remember dial up internet coming to, to my house in 95, 96. So I was a part of those, those movements, but also I have so much belief and empathy in technology and kids these days as our true opportunity, I don't look at them as the problem for the inequity in our industry. And so I, I find myself that. on that. We, I built it. We built it. No 22-year-old kid created this business model that doesn't work, 
that doesn't serve us, that yes, we were successful for 20 something years on that steep trajectory and it's played out, the, the course has been run. It's been exposed as not a viable business model. It's not equitable, profitable, sustainable. And so now we have to build something different. And the pandemic smacked everybody in the teeth. It made you realize like, uh oh, we gotta look at this differently. It accelerated all of those. All the chinks in the armor were just completely exposed, exposed yep. instantly, and sometimes laughable. And as I look back now, my job a lot is to reflect back so that I can figure out where we go next. It's tough sometimes. Like, how did I think that that was a good idea? Well, it's like anything. It's the culture we're raised in. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that we, we do nowadays, you're like, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> a lot. I mean, that's just... That's just maturity, wisdom, yeah. and, and just, you know, like, ah, we were looking at the uh, world all wrong. See, and I agree. And I think there's that wisdom moment is important. Yet, you started the show talking about kind of the David and Goliath. There's so many of these industry standards and these, these legacy entities within food and beverage that are still holding us back to what we recognize now is the need for us to move forward. And so where is that wisdom is a big question that I have. How... How do we now see what's happening? And we're still gripping so tight, white knuckle onto our past successes. And that is a, is a big it, It's what everybody knows. I know. I mean, it's, and I, I look, liken it to the U.S. military, but I spent a long time in the U.S. military, 20 years. Yeah. There's legacy systems. There's like, we've always done this, but we're fighting the last war. Mm. And that's, that's what I think the, the restaurant industry is doing. Yeah. The fighting the last war. And as guys like you, uh, our team with Manny, Pablo, Celine, our co-founder, Mario, we're just, we just have to do things differently. Yeah. And that's why we make our restaurant association, our mission statement is to advocate on behalf of the Hispanic Restaurant Tour to open and operate their restaurants effectively and efficiently. There's a lot to unpack there. Effective, better leadership, better equipment, better, better systems. Uh, effectively, once again, back to leadership. Yeah. Efficiency. Right. And then our vision statement is to educate and elevate the Hispanic community across a multi-generational spectrum. The reason we went into the restaurant industry is the, the lowest barrier to labor entry is the restaurant industry. Yeah, we come in as kids. I exactly. was 17, right? Exactly. And yeah. then you, once, if you have a good attitude, you can work. And so many of the Hispanic Latin restaurants are owned by families. That's the first one where they start with, mm -hmm. and they build these uh, systems and these great restaurants. And... But, we want them to scale and be bigger. Uh, so that's where we start with education. And education, as I talk about, that's why I think leadership is so We want to educate people how to lead properly. And we talk about that. We talked about that right before this. As Pablo and I and a couple others were going to Thornton Middle School and teaching this leadership model that's it. to them. Mm -hmm. And then we, want to, then we want to go much larger and larger. And we'll put it online so, so that there's a framework and architecture to like, okay, what do I need to do to help myself be better? There's tons of books. As people always say, go, go be, you need to be a better leader. What the hell does that mean? How the hell do I do that? <laughs> exactly. How do, you, need to, you need to go educate yourself. Well, how? And our goal is to tell the restaurants, tell the chefs, chef leaders, tell these kids, like, okay, what do you want to do? Be the best version of yourself with YouTube and podcasts and Education is very democratized if you choose to go down that path. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was a young kid. I barely graduated high school. I have a master's degree now. That and $4 will give me a cup of coffee or a latte, whatever it is nowadays. But, but it, it, it's possible. And our goal is to give people hope and a North Star. They have to do all the work. But the, the support we're getting is just amazing from the lower levels. The upper levels of the restaurant industry, well, that's to be told. That's, As I said, there's a lot of talk, but yeah. very few do. And I, and I can say that because I've been experiencing it for two years. There's a lot of talk, but not much action. We are very good, John, at the facade is what I call it. <laughs> is it? We are, we, it's ingrained in us. We built it into our business model. You, you, again, you perpetuate these tropes on it's all about the guest experience, right? right. Leave your shit at the door. It's all about that guest experience. And we don't leave, again, any, any hospitality for ourselves. We leave it all out on the field. And so you, you hear these, these things. We talk about, like, oh, you got to be a duck on the pond where you're cool and calm on top. And then you're, <laughs> you're kicking away under the water. Right. And there's absolutely strengths to that in the moment. We're very 
reactionary. We're very in the moment. We live in the now because we're able to ebb and flow and make sure that every plate comes up at the right time. We table touch within 30 seconds to drop that beverage napkin, to greet the guest, 15 minutes cycles to make sure that that guest experience, all those things are strengths. The problem is we, we only exist in that space. We only exist in that mindset and approach. And so the facade is all about, we can't show any weakness. We can't show any vulnerability. We have to make sure that the facade is up at all times. And the facade is crumbling right now because we are recognizing that our physical health, our emotional and mental health, our financial health is garbage. We have not built an industry that is for true professionals. We have built an industry that keeps us at 17-year-old kid mindset oh, through that's our entire a good, that's existence. That's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point. That's what we're trying to, to really break through. So the fact that you're going and talking to kids these days is the most important thing that I see about what you're working on. Right, like I see what you have here. I love leadership models. I've worked on my entire life. My dad worked on big corporate paradigm shifting, interpersonal team dynamic leadership training my entire life. It's like what's been ingrained in my very DNA. What I'm recognizing now, though, is I have to go talk to kids these days as well. So I ask hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions of people to find out what they actually believe, what their actual motivations are, what their actual goals are, what the actual challenges that they're facing, what they hate about working in restaurants, what they hate about the restaurant hiring process. And I take in as much information as possible, pattern recognize, which is maybe the only thing I'm actually good at, and then try to create solutions from that place. Not looking at the leaders of our industry, of successful business models, evil. I'm looking at the people and their experience, their expectations, their lack of understanding. And that's where I learn the most. And that's what's different about what I talk about than what most people want to talk about because it's easier. A, a lot of legacy media, I'll give you a, a specific example. A lot of legacy media was very good at finding me because I was the rock star chef, the rising star chef, the, the, all of the accolades on TV, on radio, in print. They were not very good at finding the dishwasher that actually makes a difference in the restaurants. They're horrible at it, right? And I recognize those are the people that actually drive our industry forward. Absolutely. There's millions of the people that drive this industry and the high percentage of them being in the Hispanic community. And so if we can't connect with and understand their goals and challenges, then anything that we're building, every business model is increasingly vulnerable to the fact that it's not built for the people it's meant to serve. And our guests are not the people that our business models should be meant to serve. That experience will be 10 times better, 100 times better, if the back of the house- Every time. No, is focused, they understand the why. Yeah. They're happy to be there. One team, one mission, all there. of it's true. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what are some of the other things you're do you, you're doing to bend the paradigm or, as I like to say, bending the strategic art? I'm breaking it into little pieces, John. I, I'm very much of the break and rebuild is really where I've, I've been focused. And a lot of that has been my own personal culpability in that. I think one of the things that we don't do enough as leaders is ask questions of ourselves and challenge ourselves. I think what we do is we look for the external factor that is that North Star, and no offense to the North Star, no, love no. the North Star, and we only look there. And I think we also have to, to tack to where you're going. You need to know where you've been. And I think that's an important aspect that I didn't understand because I am such a futurist. I am always trying to build the next thing. I had to slow down, stop, and say, how did I get here? Why was I a part of the problem? That's why, if I could stop you right there to Please. interrupt, the, the, when you talk about the North Star, that's in our leadership model, the cultural ethos, is the first team that, that anybody is ever exposed to is the family. Sure. For good or for bad. Right. <laughs> and also, and unfortunately, you know, I, after I, uh, my family team dysfunctional part, I went into the U.S. military and I was, I was led by magnificent leaders. 
and they taught me you need to educate yourself. You need to be a team player. And they actually taught me. Much of our leadership model was taught to me over the years. I just happened to have a master's degree, and I know all the theory. But I had these magnificent leaders showing me, like, this is how you train people. This is how you lead people. Like, and I love it. Uh, we did it way back when, and it was taught to me, and I did it, was leaders eat last. I would get up in the middle of the night, bring my guys coffee, bring my, you know, when we're out on patrol or something like that, would bring them food. And they're like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. I, I was a pretty senior guy on the enlisted side, but I would, I would bring it out to them. And they were like, you know you have people to do this. I'm like, yeah, that's not the point. My point is I need to understand where they're from, what they're doing, what they're thinking yeah. out there. Yeah, and you so, know, it's, it's interesting. The, <laughs> but, uh, the hardest part of looking back was understanding when I was a part of the problem, as I mentioned. More importantly, though, was separating the great memories and fond memories that we have with the toxicity that was oh. fed to us or that we were feeding. And that's really difficult. I think of certain times, for example, I was, you know, the, the chef de cuisine at Tag Restaurant. So any of the, the Denver people will kind of know that time. 2009, we built an, an amazing culture there and then we turned it to outward shit. culture or inward culture both until we forgot about the inward culture oh and it started to unravel there's an example that i talk about when we go from opportunity to obligation at the very beginning there i was so committed teaching to imparting everything that i was inspired by that i had learned to anybody who wanted to learn dishwashers on up and anybody could show up at any time on any day that they wanted, before a shift, after a shift, on a day off, and I would teach them something they want to learn. You want to learn how to butcher fish? I'll teach you oh, that. that's pretty cool. You want to learn how to make fold pot stickers? I'll teach you that. And so it was amazing. What ended up starting to happen is people would come in two hours, an hour before their shift to learn something new. And I would teach them something oh, they, amazing. So they really, people want to learn. They have that hunger. The, absolutely. I remember teaching dishwashers how to break down fish. How, and at one point we had a dishwasher uh, who was breaking down, you know, a dozen fish a day. And, you know, for the black cod, miso cod, one of the signature dishes. Right. So a dishwasher was entrusted one of the most valuable pieces of protein that we had for one of our signature dishes. And I believed in that. That was the opportunity. Over multiple years, what happened is people showing up an hour, two hours before to learn something, to develop, to be a part of what made that culture great, turned into obligation. And what happened was if you didn't show up an hour or two before your shift to do something extra, then you didn't give a shit as much as the person that did. And it was held against them. And it was held against them. And it became this social pressure. And I did not build a good enough system around the opportunity side that I was so passionate about. It was so dependent on me as an individual leader, not systemic leadership within the organization, that at every level down the hierarchy from my sous chefs to supervisors to line level, it was lost in translation to the point where that part became toxic. And so I think about this Dark Knight quote, Christopher Nolan's Batman movies. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. And I had to sit with myself and say, I have been the villain in chapters of this story. Unbeknownst to myself sometimes, out of my control sometimes, seemingly. But that is an example of how I started as a great leader and I completely let my team down in the end. And that is hard to separate. Well, that's, a, that's some deep reflection. It was tough. And I did that hundreds of times over with so many of the things that I brought as somebody who's always trying to create a nucleus of leadership, of communication, of teamwork. And so many times I hung my hat, pounded my chest a little bit with that little bit of bravado and ego and said, look what I created here. The actual experience of the people on the other end who weren't a part of the impetus of that great culture and leadership felt the exact opposite feeling and had the exact opposite response of what I put into that leadership system to start. Is, it, is how, what I, the Johari window, 
how you look at the world mm. and how they look at the world as polar opposites. A complete. So what was it like admitting that to yourself the first time? It sucked. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> and that's the part that's hard to separate because there are so many people. If you ask 100 people that work with me in that time, I won't even go with the percentage like you. A high percentage of people say, Jesse was a great leader, great chef, talented, taught me a lot of things, opened up doors, created opportunity, introduced me to people. <laughs> you will also have people that say, yeah, he was a chef like any sh other chef who was you know, <coughs> out for himself and loved reading his own newspaper clippings. And you will absolutely have a handful of people be like, that's the worst person I ever worked for. And that's a horrible feeling. Is, yeah, I understand. I, I'm familiar with that group. Right? And that's yeah. a horrible feeling. Yet, yet, if I am going to be a part of ushering in what happens next to empower and educate the future leaders of this industry, our mission is to amplify the worth and work of those who feed their community. The yeah. work side is a challenge. Right. The worth side, especially the self-worth, is the most difficult part. And so I had to start with that self-worth work myself to then separate what I thought was an amazing part of my accomplishments and success and realize that in fact, it was only half of the, of the solution. And I had to look at the people who <coughs> had a horrible experience in that system that I built and start there and build start backwards over. again. Oh, that's, that's fair. I mean, that's, we, uh, we've been doing this no less than two years, but the HRA, we have that very similar outlook. Let's build it from the ground up. Yeah, that's and, and that's uh, why we're talking. And then I love it's, it. It's great. Like I told you before this, I can't mention the the restaurant group, but we placed twenty people in the past two weeks, and that's pretty amazing. Yes. Group interviews talk about uh, we talk about the expectation from the employee people. Uh, we talk about from the employer, and I'm like, let's let's figure this out. And they've been magnificent. And so I, and Good. if we do this model correctly, then we can expand it to the next one and to the next one and recognize the value of both sides. As we tell the employee, that's it, uh, the employee, like if, if you're the best version of yourself, if you show up, you're accountable, you can grow to a GM. You can be yeah. your own business. You can own your day. own trajectory. Exactly. And, and on the employer side, we're like, if you understand, talk about that cultural ethos, treat them well, tell them how to get there. Understanding life happens, that happens to everybody. But if you can do that, then we all, you see each other as humans. Often, you know, there's mm. that language and cultural barrier. That's why we have the Food and Beverage Language Institute. That's why we communicate with translators and like, let us help you learn English. Let us help you understand the American culture. Let us help you understand how to get to being wherever you want to go. It's, it's, and, it's a generational fight. I clearly recognize that. Oh, yeah. And so, but but why not? If not us. That's why we say who. That's exactly it. Why not us? <laughs> exactly. If who, not us, then who? Who else is going to do it? And, yeah, that's a big part of my why, too, is extending that generational piece because I started to recognize the family legacy, the impact that it had on me. There's, there's kind of two sides to it. Number one, I was never asked, when are you going to get a real job? I think there's a lot of that social pressure within the family dynamic of, okay, cool, you worked at a concession stand, and then you went and worked at a restaurant, you were a busser, now you're a bartender. Okay, when are you going to go to college? When are you going to achieve the American dream? Because that doesn't happen in the restaurant industry. So I wasn't asked that because generationally, we've been successful to varying degrees in the restaurant industry. And so I didn't feel that pressure. I also recognized some of the challenges that my family faced, how at certain moments, my family was so beholden to the restaurant that they could never escape it. Retirement is a, a dream. It, it's, not a, it's not a thing, right? And so I had to grapple with that a little bit. What does it mean for me to be a part of this industry? And I definitely struggled. As soon as I hit you know, 33 years old and recognized that I couldn't do this anymore, that physically, emotionally, mentally, I was just not, I was just not there anymore. I burned too hot for too long. And I was done. And now you recognize that how to avoid part of your goals to tell people how not to get there? Absolutely. We have to create a different definition Model. for success so that success doesn't look like this. I, I, no. I'm, no. This is all I'm doing this whole show is showing you guys steep trajectories. This is my whole thing. It's like we have to flatten out the curve just a little bit so that you can be successful 
without it taking everything from you. And so that was the challenge of the family legacy side of, can I be a part of this industry without owning the restaurant and being the chef owner? And so I struggled with that for several years as I went out and started doing consulting work and product development and launched a couple other companies. How do I contribute and be a high contributor in this industry without being the chef of the restaurant? And so even like my social media handles, Mario, I love this. I struggle with the chef Jensen coming sometimes because am I still a chef? I don't work in a restaurant 75 hours a week anymore. Or am I always chef, just like somebody who is coach is always coach? I think you're always chef. And, and I, I, I still I don't know. When right? I see guys from the military, they still call me by my old title, senior chief. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, it's kind of cool. <laughs> you know? I, I appreciate it, and it makes me uncomfortable at the same time. And I think I, I need to, again, I need to live in the space of being uncomfortable and knowing then what the ramifications of the choices I make, the, the things I put out in the world, the advice that I give. And so a lot of the advice that I give, it comes from this place of I had to ask myself so many questions. And I went all the way back to even with being a young kid. And one of the things that I've always done in my life is be that annoying kid who's going, why, why, why? Asking a thousand questions. And I was like, you know what? I still do it. Maybe that was a superpower. (laughs) It was annoying as hell. You ask my siblings and my parents, like, you would never shut up. You just ask question after question after question. And finally you were like, how is steel made? I was like, go away from me, kid. I don't know. Now I can just ask my phone how any question, right? And so information is commoditized, yet the ability to ask questions is not. And that's what I spend most of my time, John, now doing is asking questions. And I mentioned before I ask hundreds and hundreds of questions. And I do, just on my Facebook today, I asked, what was your favorite past job, why? I ask those kind of questions and hundred people, hundreds of people will answer every single week. I ask those kind of open-ended questions. How many years have you been in the industry or were you in the industry? Just to get people telling me something that helps me contextualize the goals, the challenges, the needs, the wants of our industry. And then I'm trying to connect kind of the user experiences here. What is the restaurant experience to your point? And what is also the worker experience? So I asked hundreds and hundreds of questions. I'll give you a specific example about the hiring process, give you an idea of kind of how I work. Hundreds of questions. I asked questions like, what don't you like about resumes? What what don't you like about the interview process? What's the worst interview question you ever got asked? What's the best interview question you ever got? Best boss, worst boss. I asked those kind of questions and get taken literally thousands, tens of thousands of responses. And I try to pattern recognize and understand the why behind it, the how behind it. And I asked this of the hiring process. And after looking through all of the responses from workers, I came down to three reasons that people hate the restaurant hiring process. A lack of humanity, felt like cattle. Yeah, it's just just coming through the door, coming through the door. How many times have you sat down for an interview, somebody grabs your resume and looks at it and stares at you, clearly looking at your resume for the first time ever? And you expect that this person is going to understand you from a piece of paper and 30 minute seconds. interview. That was, that was a huge eye opener. So we had to shift that modality of the way that we hire a waste of time, complete waste of time. The amount of, the amount that I heard somebody go, I showed up for my three o'clock interview. I sat there until three twenty. I saw the manager running around. Then I saw the manager back there clearly looking at me and showing that they were in control and power. And they were going to be able to waste my time because their time was more valuable than mine. And then I went back for the interview, which was cut short because of X, Y, and Z. And then they finally looked at my resume for the first time. It was a waste of time. What would you do different? So we had to address that. So we created a model where there was was three tiers. There was a 10-minute phone interview, a 24-minute video chat, and a 40-minute in-person. And it was important to tier it that way because there's different communication style. There's a lot of issues when it came to transportation, to attire, to different things that it takes for an interview process. And just letting people know in an hour and 15 minutes through these three steps of process, we're going to evaluate you and you're going to evaluate us. Released a lot of anxiety in the process of I'm going to show up at three o'clock and I don't know how long this interview is going to be. I don't you know, really how don't I'm know who you're going to talk to. I don't know who I'm going to talk to. And that was the third part of this was a lack of knowledge of expectations. 
And so we set clear expectations to the point where even here's the kind of interview questions I'm interested in asking you, allowing people to feel prepared. Because I used to think that my job is to put so much pressure on people in an interview, either a stage working interview or a verbal interview, that they broke, that I saw them for who they really were. And the reality is I need to create an environment that makes them the most comfortable to share who they really are, not to have the defense mechanisms of I'm going to feed you the same bullshit answers that I've been told years and years and years or what you expect to hear. We wonder why resumes and answers to questions are exactly the same because we've told them, don't do this, do this, you can't do this, you have to do this. Yeah, cookie cutter. Yeah. And everything is completely cookie cutter. And so I wanted to break th all of those cycles. And then I also recognized that there was that lack of humanity, you, to your point, I didn't know who I was going to be interviewing with. Right? And so there's, again, anxiety in that. I can tell you why people no-show for interviews. I have a lot of reasons why people no-show because I asked and they told me. Imagine that. <laughs> I sent, I, here's what I did, John. I did a model with one of our clients on the restaurant consulting side of the work that we do. And I picked up my phone. And I said, I'm going to make people feel comfortable with talking to me in their 10 minute chat interview. And I did this a hundred and something times. I picked up my phone. I said, Hi, John. I'm Jensen. I'm going to be doing your 10-minute chat interview. I'm excited to speak with you. I saw that you worked with uh, Zuri Resendez when he was at Catavella. I can't wait to hear about what that experience was like for you. I'll talk to you tomorrow, Wednesday at 2 p.m. So you record that and send it to him? I send them a 20-second video, 15-second video. Okay. We took a model where about right now the industry standard is 75% of people no-show to interviews. Right, yep. And that number is probably low. 88% of people showed up to the interviews we put Really? Out. 88%. Yeah. And what's, what's the sample size there? About 100 and, and something was, so was some for this So decent size. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With, with only cursory, like, I literally was like, can I do four things differently? That's it. So you can imagine what it is now that we've like, been able to develop it. I don't know, 90% of people who I interviewed made mention of the video ridiculous oh. amount. I was, they're like, oh, thanks for sending a video over. Clearly, I had looked the at your resume. Side, so. I cared enough to look at your resume, to say something meaningful about it. I also reinforced that your interview is tomorrow at 2 p.m. I gave you my name. Yeah. I gave you a little bit of personality. I used your name. All things that people felt were, were undervalued in the process. It took me less than 20, 20 seconds to do that. I told hundreds of restaurateurs that. The overwhelming majority of them told me, they're not going to show up. That's a waste of time. It's like so they're stuck in that old model. It's like, you're right. They are not going to show up to your interview. And, and that was a big part of the way that I approach these things. But to your point, you also have to take the restaurant into consideration because the animosity is in the connective tissue and the communication and lack thereof between workers and restaurants. And so I asked hundreds and hundreds of restaurateurs, where are your issues? What's happening? And it came down to three places where we identify what we call uh, hiring process leakage. There's, there's waste in the process. There was, number one, not enough people apply to jobs. Not enough people show up to interviews. And not enough people accept job offers. Those are the three places they were losing people in the hiring process. So we <clears throat> specifically created solutions, what we call our five solutions. Love the five pillars. Our five solutions are based on how do you get more people to apply to your job? How do you get people to actually show up to the interview? And how do you get people to accept the job? And so there's a whole slew of things that happen in each of those interactions that are completely, completely getting lost in translation. So that, again, is where I have to spend a lot of my time. I mean, like, okay, worker, restaurant, here's why they don't like you. Here's why they don't like you. Here's why you want to be a part of what they're doing. Here's why you need them to be a part of what you're doing. Can we talk about this? Like, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm a counselor sometimes, like doing mediation, like I'm doing a, a couples therapy or something. It, it, that's the only way I know is to increase communication, to have some clarity and consistency in that communication. It's the only way that I know how to make any meaningful change between people. It, it's wild what you're doing, and we didn't even know each other was doing these different things. Was yeah, <laughs> until we start talking, we're like, we're doing all the same things. It, it, exactly. Like uh, in the past two weeks with, with the major chain, we've been like, I've been bringing people. Yeah. And like, it's a mass interview, but it's more the, you know, the dishwasher, the prep, the bakery, 
I'm like, let's all figure this out. And I, I sit there and watch, and it, it's magnificent. The expectation, everybody shows up on time. I tell the employees, mm. be clean cut, be polite, be all these different things. I tell the employer, which they've been great on the store levels and the operational, the regionals, and it, we just kind of coordinate these efforts instead of six different times or eight different times or 10 different times. It's like everybody's there. It's I like a, the group interview. It's a group interview. Yes. And and we, from a leadership perspective, like this is why they're going to hire you. If you are like enthusiastic, if you want to work there, if you're going to give them the best version for, t for eight hours, 10 hours, you're going to go far because they want people like you yeah. and you want to work hard. The Hispanic or Latin worker is the great stereotype about them is they're known for their hard work. Our goal is to channel that into educating themselves, leadership, and then go on that growth, that path of progression, as we call it. Yeah, that's really cool. So it, it really is fascinating. We, you know, you, you got a you know few year head start on me, but it, it's it's great. I don't know. I feel like I'm starting over too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I, I didn't mean that. Like, I mean in the sense of it's great. We're doing. You recognized it a couple of years before I did, but you know we've. Well, there's an interesting thing in that. I get asked to speak on podcasts, uh, on stages, about being an expert in X, Y, Z in this industry. And one of the things that I had to do in this kind of new revelation of where I need to be as, as part of a high contributor in this industry from a different place than being the chef in the kitchen was recognizing that an expert can only be an expert on something that happened in the past. So I let go of the term expert. Anywhere it was in my bios or in the, the PR kits, media kits, it's gone. I'm so focused on building the future that, yes, I'm going to lean on my expertise and my experience, yet your expertise only gets you to where you are today. Right. And we need to build something different and new. So I had to let go of that a lot, which is, again, a struggle because I got paid really good money to speak as an expert. And now I have to have the humility to say, I'm no longer that here's what i'm offering now you're just more of a problem solver you're like that's I, it <laughs> I, that, that's how i view ours because uh somebody described it to me and they're like you're, you're building the airplane as you fly it oh, I'm, like, man. I'm like absolutely because I'm with like, like oh, rubber kids tools i feel like sometimes legos we we got. Were, is i mean like oh we need this new system that's right. why we're building an entire ecosystem from you know this media from the yep. colorado food magazine to Love. the property of the latin food network which we Love. own and we're going to build so I have to, we have to own these systems that when i go to other people they're just like oh that'll be 10,000 bucks i'm you like, got to own the infrastructure exactly especially on the storytelling side of it exactly and you you're perfect at that so tell me we're going to shift but tell me about what made you think of and do build that infrastructure? What sure. made you do that? Isn't it wild? We've let me give you let me give you some of the like context of where we're at. Started the podcast on November eighteenth, two thousand nineteen. It was just an audio podcast on March eighteenth, two thousand twenty, when all restaurants were shutting down. Shifted to a live Facebook podcast. Through the pandemic, we're coming up on 500 episodes produced. We've guest hosted with a lot of partners. We've, we're in the like 3 million views of our content. Oh, wow. Of, of just our shows. It's unreal. Of our, of our extended content, we're in the tens of millions now. It's hard for me to even understand the impact that that has. You're going to have to help us. I'm there. A hundred percent, whatever you need, Mario needs, I'm there. I am an open book. I literally actually, as I did the fake holding up my phone, I saw that Joshua Wolbook, who has Love Food More, who's a great food content producer, been on the show, is now starting a podcast, and he's messaging me about advice for the podcast, and he gets all of it. Unfettered access to information. It's important to me. So taking you back, I started the podcast, Best Served Podcast, as a way to acknowledge what I call unsung hospitality heroes. Literally everybody we've been talking about. <laughs> so many of the people that I took for granted, potentially, or that I was able to uplift and put into amazing positions that now are the executive chef, the owner, the sous chef, whatever that might be. And so I have to, again, I have to grapple with how proud I am of that and how much I did not acknowledge and recognize the people that should have been acknowledged and recognized. And so I wanted to, to acknowledge those people. 
So the model of the first audio podcast that I did on my phone with a tiny little call center headset. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> sitting in the parking lot of my gym half the time with hoodies hanging around me as dampening for better sound quality. Mario, you should listen. To, they're horrible. And I would just have conversations with a lot of times it was, it was chef friends of mine or people in the industry or somebody who I got introduced to which were amazing conversations, 35, 40 minutes with them. The most important part of that conversation, though, was the last 10 minutes of the show. And the last 10 minutes of the show was they had to acknowledge somebody and give me somebody else that was an unsung hero to them in their career that I could then talk to. So people gave me sous chefs, first culinary instructor, their, their, their former boss, somebody who was unheralded, potentially, in the industry that I would then put on this pedestal of media, right? right? I would give them a platform. They've never been invited to speak on the behalf of anything. They've never been acknowledged as somebody who has meaningful contribution to the industry, yet they could be on my podcast. And the goal from there was to then be able to have them be the primary of that show their own episode, and then for them to pay it forward to another person that they want to acknowledge and keep that going. When we finally hit March and the pandemic and everything started to shut down, I recognized that we can't just have these, these open-ended, meaningful conversations today. Right. People needed real-time information. They needed to feel like there was somebody who was going to communicate with them. So I went, John, I went on the offensive like you wouldn't believe. On March 18th, I went live on Facebook for the first time horrible, <laughs> no idea what I was doing. And I did not stop for six months. I was on seven days a week for six months, many times multiple shows a day because I just needed to hustle and communicate. That's all I knew oh, I, I could so do funny. at that moment. And so I learned a lot putting out hundreds of shows over that time period, brought in new technology, found people who then started show running, started creating extension content, a lot of what like Mario does. I started finding these people and bringing on interns, found business partners, like all of it evolved because I was just out there speaking about and to anybody who wanted to, needed to feel connected have some advice, have actionable feedback on here's how you apply for PPP loans, here's how you get on unemployment, anything that I could help with the information oh, wow. that people needed. So you just, you're, you're a conduit and source of information to help. That's just a it. platform. That, that, I that's try to awesome. be real time, breaking news for our industry and or what are you doing today? What are you struggling with? What happened? You had to lay off employees. Are you hiring people back? Anything that I could do to kind of speak to the industry through the pandemic was really important. And it just led us to learning. I mean, we accelerated our ability to produce, again, millions of views and tens of millions of content well, engagement. That's pretty amazing. It's that's nuts. I had, I have no idea. I still, John, I still have no idea what I'm doing. I can just tell you what I've done. <laughs> and certain things that we've done have had no effect, no impact, no quality, and some have shot the moon. So yeah. you, just, well, you gonna, never know. We're gonna. I'm gonna ask you a lot of questions because that's what that's what I'm we want to do. It. Because we really, really want to tell, send the message out there. There's a support system. There's a mechanism. Uh, we know, recognize some of the issues out there. Mm. We're just trying to solve it. I'm not trying to blame people. I'm just trying to solve it. Yeah. And and if you work with us, then we're really easy to work with. Well, well I, I, we need to wrap this up. We're mm. uh, we've gone long, which that's is great. great. <laughs> I don't know, and we can have another five hour conversation. Yeah, this might be a part one and part two. I, I, I think it is going to be absolutely because there's so much that we're we're doing, so much that you're doing. Uh, even though we didn't know each other, you know, past a couple of weeks ago, and we made this fa happen fast. Exactly. I met Mario a couple of months ago. We talked like a week ago. Now we're here, and I'm sure this is just the start of us working on a lot of things together. Oh, so. absolutely. And that's uh, uh, my my goal is to help the the Latin Hispanic. We're all workers. Is it leadership model? Because leadership is at all levels. Yeah. Uh, we have. Yeah, your work is going to extend. You have a core audience, which I think is really important. It also, from a strategic standpoint, gives you leverage against all these big Goliaths who are just trying to churn people through oh, their system. Now you, they, they need the attention of your audience oh, and no. you're now giving your audience a higher self-worth. Exactly. And that is incredibly powerful. 
Oh, no. I'm excited it, to see what you all I mean, do with we, it. we started out with, you know, maybe five, ten. Now there's thousands that follow yeah. us. And it'll, I, I predict it'll be millions one day. And it's not because of me. Be. It's because of the team. And it's because of what Mario's doing, what Luis, who we're going to interview next after the, these great chefs. It's what Manny's doing, what yeah. Pablo's doing, what Fernando's doing, what Celine's doing. It's, it's really, we all have this common mission to educate and elevate. And educate the world about the talent that's already out there. Uh, get them educated so they can go as far as they want. Yeah. And elevate them. Tell the story. I got to give you. A, I got to give you one story before we wrap. Okay. Uh, the proudest moment that I've had in doing all the media and podcasting was not having Andrew Zimmern on the show, or Ming Tsai on the show, or Claudine Papan on the show. All of these big names who have been absolute legends in our industry that I've had the honor to be able to speak to and with. It was being able to interview Delfina Serrano, who is my dishwasher at Tag Restaurant. Oh, you told me about the story. Go ahead. The Go best. Keep. The best. We called her Mighty Mouse. She was, is a mother of three, came from Mexico with nothing, the classic story, and just made something of herself. We called her Mighty Mouse because the dish station at Tag Restaurant, up two flights of stairs to the main kitchen. She, <laughs> she would carry a stock pot as tall as her in a dish rack up these stairs to put the dish rack down, to stand on, to be able to hang the stock pot up, from the hook because she's maybe four foot 10. <laughs> Between wow. 2009, maybe 2010 to 2012, if you had a soup dumpling or a pot sticker at Tag Restaurant, which tens of thousands of people did, millions of those were produced, there's probably a 50-50 chance that she rolled them. She taught herself how to do that by getting the dishes done and sitting down there and watching anybody who was rolling pot stickers or soup dumplings and just started jumping in there. Right. Delfina Serrano is the most important person I've ever spoken to because one, that is the person that I want to put on a pedestal for what it means to be exemplary excellence in our industry. And for me, because it pushed me back to that place of reflecting what mattered and who mattered to me and to be able to have her on a show, have her speak Spanish. We had a translator on, have legacy media, Amanda Faison, who put 5280 on the map who then did Dining Out Magazine, who's like one of the most prolific journalists that the Colorado food scene has ever had. She worked with me to create the back page of the Dining Out Magazine, which was for unsung heroes. And I was able to introduce her to people like Delfina Serrano and get her in print and on an episode. That's what meant the most to me. And that's what you're trying to build with putting Delfina Serrano and everybody like her on a pedestal is what we need to do in this industry. We need to flip the narrative of who gets acknowledgement in our industry. 100% agree. And that's why some of the things that, like, this is the first time I'm going to talk about it. We are coming out with our We're own. breaking news? Oh, yeah, we is. It All is. Right. It's called the Kidzali's Guide. It's our own version. Everybody knows about the Michelin star. Uh, Fernando Stobel has uh, been appointed the chairman by our leadership. It's going to be a separate organization because I, I don't want to be able to have to choose who's the best and who's not in the Latin chef world. It's problematic. <laughs> yes. Exactly, exactly, yes. exactly. But we're going to we're going to ch change that paradigm. Yeah. Uh, you know, by as I we just spoke, uh, if you don't like the rules of the game, change the rules. That's right. And the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, that's the old, right. Uh, how do you win an unwinnable game? Change the rules. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. The talents out there, I have nothing to do with the talents out there, but I do have something to do with the platform. Yeah. We have something to yeah, do with the platform. Yeah, you got to focus platform. it and funnel it. Exactly. And, and we're going to do that. And uh, we're going to, over the next year, we're going to find uh, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 of the best Latin chefs, Can't wait. Mex uh, Latin restaurants in the U.S. and eventually the world. I, I'm going to send that challenge out there. We're We're here. And, and, and Fernando, who, as I told you, is a world-renowned chef. He's on MasterChef Mexico, along with Pablo, along with Manny. They're going to shift the paradigm. Not me. I'm, yeah. I just happen to be a, a guy that happened to be in the right spot at the right time. So That's th great. And uh, we're going to I'm sure that. we'll have models that, that we can help feed into and vice versa. Yeah. Let's get them on Best Served in Espanol so that we can amplify exactly. their voice and their and, message. And my challenge to it. you would help us open up our network to even yeah. more powerful... Uh, uh, people that can tell these stories. Yeah. So thank you for coming on. Sure. What's the last word? Sure. Uh, and what would you tell an 18-year-old you? <laughs> Go get a real job. <laughs>
right? What I never was told. Uh, I actually do believe that our job is to create the opportunity that this is a workplace worth working. That the restaurant industry, the hospitality industry is of the highest merit and value. And right now, it's not, and we've been exposed as such. So that's think what about I want that. to really focus You're on. You're absolutely right, but think about it. When you want to have your special guests, when you want to entertain people, we want to get, what do we do? We break bread together. We break out the best china. We break out the, the drinks, the special that's tequila right. or the whiskey. That's, it's all around food. That's Every where the opportunity is. in the is. world. Exactly. See, the problem is there's, there's two things that a restaurant does. I've talked about this. You produce food, which unfortunately is a commodity. And in our country, it is a commodity that is not very highly valued. We spend less as a percentage of income on food than any industrialized nation in the world. We don't value food. There's a lot of reasons, laws, subsidies that go into that. The farmer journey that goes into that, underpaid labor at that level. All of those things go into that. The second thing that a restaurant offers is a memory and an experience. And we value memory and experience maybe more than any culture in history. Right? We value story and connection. Just look at anybody's Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube. We value that. So if we focus on valuing that, we create true hospitality on all levels of that experience from our internal guests, our employees, then I and all of us can leave this, better in, this industry better than we found it. Right. I can hold my head up high and with no pressure from me, ask my kids if they want to be the sixth generation of our family to be of service to this industry. My answer is yes, I feel good about that, then we've done our job. That's right. what I want to leave people with. And, I, and I'll uh, ask one question. I'll leave my book, and then you think about what book you'd recommend. Mm. And then is, uh, I just finished, oh, it's been a few weeks, and I, now it's going to be required reading for the leadership, and I highly recommend is Unreasonable Hospitality sure. by Will Godera about yeah. how to be the best. And then what book would you recommend? You said Leaders Eat Last. Let's go with that. Simon Sinek's book, Leaders Eat Last. Big fan of what he talks about in that one for sure. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on board. Love it. Appreciate you. Mm -hmm.